Well, thank you all for coming. And I'm honored to present the story of my grandmother, Molly Griffin. I've done a lot of ranching history and focusing on just the timeline of who did what where. But I had never taken it from the perspective of my grandmother. So I titled this Pretty as a Picture and Tough as Saddle Leather because she truly was. Molly Griffin's ranching history in Arizona began in 1725 when the King of Spain sent um, Nicholas Romero to colonize New Spain or the New World. He founded the Buena Vista Ranch south of Guavavi along the Santa Cruz River and on today's map, that ranch would straddle the Mexico and US border. So it was quite extensive. The Romeros ranched there until the 1750s when rebel Pima Indians launched attacks, which killed many family members and forced them out and ultimately further north to the Pima de Alta, now known as Tucson. There are still Romero relatives living in Tucson and Romero Road is named for them. Maria Concepcion Romero was born in Tucson in 1841, the youngest of 21 children, one father and two mothers. So there's extensive Romero relatives everywhere. She married John C. Clark, a soldier with the US Army and commissary chief at the Old Pueblo in 1858. She and John had three daughters, Juana, Amelia, and Emma, or Manuela, as she was uh, baptized. He was sent as a scout to the fledgling mining camp of Globe in 1875 and built one of the first permanent homes there, something other than a tent. One morning, while John was out scouting, Maria was hanging laundry out in her yard when the Apache kid appeared in her yard. She said, good morning. And he said, do you know who I am? And she said, yes, I do. And he replied, aren't you afraid of me? She said, no, are you hungry? He said, yes. So she took him into her home and fed him breakfast from a cabinet that still is in use at the ranch today. Molly was born in 1887 to Emma Alvin and Emma Clark Beach, and she lived in Globe all of her life. Emma was widowed when Alvin died from heart disease at a young age, and she was faced with raising her three daughters, pictured here. On the left is Rose, the youngest, and then Hattie was the eldest, and then Molly is there on the right. She had to work to support these three little children, and so she hired an Apache woman to care for them while she worked. And she was one of the first matrons at the first hospital in Globe, where the fire station stands now. But Molly grew up speaking Spanish, English, and Apache all her life. That became interesting later on when she hired Apache cowboys at the ranch they would be speaking Apache and were quite surprised when she answered them in Apache. When they got older, Molly and her sisters would deliver loaves of bread that Emma had baked to Globe's Ladies of the Evening via the back alley. This is a picture of Broad Street about that time. And there's Molly and then her sister Rose, a friend, and then their cousin Belle. Neary. Molly told me the ladies were kind and often slipped them a nickel so that they might buy a treat when they were in town. However, if they happened to pass on Broad Street, the ladies would merely wink at them so as not to sully their reputation. This is a picture of, on the left, standing, uh, it was seated, is Maria Concepcion Romero, and on her the man on her side is um, Augustine Salazar, who married uh, their daughter. Then there's Molly, and then another Salazar child. You can see how tiny Molly was at that time. Tiny little waist. And the dress that's over here was hers that she wore. 
She was maybe five feet five and 100 pounds. On the right side is the picture. On the far right is her mother, Emma Beach. And then Molly is next to her wearing the cross. And then more of her Romero cousins. They all remained close for the rest of their lives, and I'm still in touch with many of their descendants today. John Griffin had moved from Texas to Globe in 1904 to begin cattle ranching in the area. John and Molly were married in 1912, and their first home was a three-room adobe structure which served as ranch headquarters and had been built in 1905 by the previous owners. There's a picture of John and Molly horseback, and then this picture is Molly riding side saddle. She was an excellent horsewoman and an expert shot. This area of the ranch was bordered by the Apache Reservation, and Molly recalled that White River and Sibiqui Indians would travel to San Carlos on foot. They would stop at the ranch, and Molly would give them coffee, beans, salt pork, and then they would camp overnight. She also recalled the tattoos that they had on their arms. When the government formed reservations, agents were not able to pronounce the Apache names and created tattoos for identification when they handed out their supplies. One of the descendants of CB10 still works on the ranch today. This is a picture of the adobe home that she moved into with some additions on the back side there. But it basically was just the three rooms. To reach the ranch, located about 20 miles northeast of Globe, John and Molly traveled by car from Globe to San Carlos. And then they rode horseback and led pack mules with supplies up seven mile wash. On one of those trips, Molly was wearing a big, heavy coat with a large belt. And then she heard John yell for her to duck for a low-hanging branch. She laid over the saddle horn. The belt was caught in the branch, and she was left dangling <laughs> until John stopped laughing and rescued her. John also became a banker when independent banks had sprung up in small mining towns and he became vice president of the First National Bank of Globe. That building is still standing today and in use, and it's just right across the street to the north from the Valley National, the old Valley Bank building, the haircutting place now. But that's where that was. In those days, bank officers backed all loans and were responsible if a borrower defaulted. With severe drought and the depression, many ranchers could not repay their loans. And thus, John acquired several ranches in Gila County, ranging from Tonto Basin to Cherry Creek to Wheatfields and Globe. It was said that the ranch in Wheatfields, when he took it over, had 4,000 head of cattle on it. As he acquired these ranches from the uh, customers who defaulted, he combined four of them into what became the Griffin Cattle Branch, which has carried the Explore brand since 1923. When there was a run on the bank at the height of the Depression, John wired San Francisco for money, but it did not arrive in time. And the First National Bank went under that day and was taken over by the Old Dominion Bank, which ultimately became the Valley National Bank. In the early 1920s, John and Molly built this beautiful home made of tufa stone, <clears throat> excuse me, quarried from San Carlos. And Molly is pictured here in the living room of that home. Faced with bankruptcy in 1926 due to the depression, they had to choose between keeping the house or keeping the ranch. They chose the ranch. This home is still in use today and serves as the globe School District Administration Building. Yeah. When a rancher bought a ranch at that time, and even today it includes all the cattle on the ranch, but at that time, some of the cattle that were still there were wild Mexican longhorn cattle that were kind of left over and 
became part of what he, the branch required. And these were called blackjackers. The Forest Service had been created in 1905 to manage the land and grazing and had, re, had directed John to remove them. In 1932, John was working at rounding up blackjackers, and he had roped two large wild steers to lead them to the corral. The steers became spooked and turned back, causing John's horse to fall over backwards on him. And he had severe internal injuries from the saddle horn. However, the cowboys that were with him helped him back on his horse, and he rode to the adobes about two miles away, that, that house, the adobe house that I referred to. There was no road down into where this adobe house sat. It's kind of down in a, a canyon, and at that time there was no road down there. So the cowboys picked him up in his iron bed and packed him up to the hill to where the truck was parked. That bed is still in use by my nephew, Ben, to this day. The 1927 truck that transported him still sits in the ranch today as yard art. It doesn't really work anymore so well. But unfortunately, John died the next day and is buried in the Globe Cemetery. Molly was left a widow to manage the ranch, quite a feat for a woman in those days and to rear their only child. My dad is pictured here on the left when he was probably about seven or eight. And when he needed to go to school, they would live in the Fisk Apartments, that are the arched building there, so that he could go to school. She hired local cowboys to tend to the ranch. And a lot of, um, well, I can't, bring them, Jack Jones was one of them. A lot of high school kids came out to help her. And one of those cowboys was Shorty Carraway, a cowboy from Texas, and a former partner in the JU Ranch with John Griffin. His life is, is chronicled in the Ross Santee book, Cowboy. Shorty had a wooden cabin that somehow was held together with no nails, could be taken apart, put on a pack saddle, on a mule, and taken to wherever part of the ranch the cowboys were working. And at that time, it was open range and 40-some thousand acres to cover. That cabin is still somewhat in use today. It needs, I think, nails now to help hold it up. <laughs> One time, Shorty had set it up about two miles from this adobe structure. And the cowboys were enjoying an evening card game when they ran out of kerosene for their lamp. He told one of the other young cowboys, John Clark Carlock, a Globe native, to ride to the adobes and borrow one of Molly's kerosene lamps, made of glass with a glass chimney. And Shorty told him he'd better not break it on the trip back or Molly would have his hide. He rode back with the lamp clutched to his chest and made it just fine. John Carlock would later become the fiscal assistant secretary of the treasury, and he would visit Molly anytime he was here in town. And he is buried up in Vernon on the ranch that he ultimately came to, to own. This is a picture of early ranching and the way they did it back then, all horseback, rope and drag the calves to the fire to brand. Molly dealt with drought, fluctuating cattle prices, forest service regulations, and yet she kept the ranch viable and successful until her son Jimmy left college in 1940 to help run the ranch until he joined the army. When it came time to sell her cattle in the spring, she contracted with a buyer from Texas. She would meet him at the ranch shipping pens that look much the same with some additions to it today. The scale is still there and still in use. But she had a priest friend who acted as a witness when she weighed the cattle, the yearlings, and loaded them on the trucks for, to be sent to feed lots in Texas. Molly was active in community fairs, and Holy Angels Catholic Church 
as well as being an astute businesswoman. The stained glass window over the altar at Holy Angels was donated by Molly and her sisters and reads, in memory of our mother, Emma Beach. She also became one of the first women to join the Arizona State Cattle Growers Association in the 1930s, another unusual feat for a woman. In 1942, Molly relocated the headquarters from the adobes down in the canyon to the X4 camp. She built that beautiful brick home, and you can see behind the garage that was separate there. And this is the canning kitchen that she had. And it was a two room with that um, canvas porch across the front before it got uh, added onto. Molly and her niece were alone at the ranch when the house burned in 1944. And everything was lost including John's papers relating to his early history and the selling and purchase of his ranches, my dad's guns, everything was gone. She and her niece were alone when that happened and had, it was a faulty floor furnace and they were miles from the highway camp, just down 60, and it, just, there was just no option to save it. It had to have been so heartbreaking for her when she had to let my dad know who was over in England during World War II. So she sent him a telegram said, saying what happened. And I have to imagine his thoughts about how he would respond to that telegram, knowing how devastating it would have been for her. His telegram back to her read, I'm a poor little sheep with no place to sleep. Tell me, did you save the rum? <laughs> and I, I think, it, you know, that gave everybody a sigh of relief. With Jimmy coming home from World War II with his bride, Minnie, a whack from Boston that he had met in England, Molly enlarged the canning kitchen into four rooms where all three of them would lead to live together. It had to be quite an adjustment for all of them Molly and Jimmy ran the ranch. Molly handled the financial aspects, and Jimmy managed the day-to-day -day operations. My mother, Minnie, stayed busy cooking and having babies. With grandchildren sure to arrive, and six ultimately did. They had four girls, and I'm the firstborn. I, I don't call myself the oldest yet, but I'm the firstborn. Then my brother, John, and then our ba the baby, Janet, came. So she bought a two-story home in Globe at the corner of Six Shooter and Ice House Canyon. I've heard so many stories about this that once it was a hospital and I'll run into people and say, I know that house, I was born there, or my grandparents lived there. So it has a history that I haven't traced that far back yet. But Molly remodeled it beautifully. And during the school year, we all lived in town and spent the summers at the ranch. My dad traveled back and forth pretty much every day to keep an eye on what needed to be going on at the ranch. She played the piano by ear, sang beautifully, and taught us many songs in Spanish. This home is still in the Griffin family. With all of us kids, in the, and it was two-story, and it had a staircase going up, and my dad would come in from the ranch and be hot and tired and a little bit cranky. And we would be getting in a spat or having, you know, uh, words as children. And my dad, when he'd had enough of the squalling and the bawling, he would whip off his belt. And you could hear that whip, whip, whip through the loops. And then he'd chase us up the stairs, banging that belt on the stairs until Molly would come and see what was going on, and she would say, Jimmy, don't you hurt those girls. And she saved us all a lot of, um, I don't remember ever getting a, well, I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was when we were living in the house at the ranch, and I was probably six, and we had a, a propane cook stove there. And to turn it on, 
you had to light the match, turn the burner knob, put the match down, and then it fired up. And the same in the oven. You had to, and you always lit the match first, and then you ducked your head in the oven and put it down to start the fire. And I was always told, don't you dare turn any of those knobs ever. And I'm thinking, well, what could happen? What, you know, what? Well, one day, I turned a knob. And Molly came in to light the oven. And of course, the first thing you always did was light the match. So she put her head down in the oven, and it poofed. It blew the nylons off of her legs. It put a little dent in the side of the stove. But thank God, nothing else bad happened. It didn't cause any further damage. But I do remember the belt that day. <laughs> Molly was a member of the Business and Professional Women's Club, the Zonta Club, and Holy Angels Altar Society. She had many friends, and often they would stop by her house, enjoy a glass of sherry, and converse in Spanish. And as kids, we all wondered what is are they talking about in Spanish that we're not supposed to hear? She also liked to visit the slot machines in the back room of the Elks Club or at Tulane's Bar, the only two places in town with gambling. Her six grandchildren are pictured here. My brother John, Joanne, myself, Janet, Sue, and Therese. And together we make up the Griffin Ranch Partnership. Now, over 100 years later, the ranch is still viable. It is one of the longest continuously operating ranches in Gila County, thanks to Molly's grit, determination, and faith. She and John had both come down with typhoid fever at the same time and were cured with the help of teas and enemas made from a native shrub. She faced bankruptcy, the death of her husband, losing her home to fire, severe droughts, and an unpredictable cattle market. She truly was tough as saddle leather. Molly died in Globe in 1966 at age 79 and is buried next to John in the Globe Cemetery. I am sure she is looking down with pride as Griffin Cattle Ranch has recently been named to the Arizona Farming and Ranching Hall of Fame. Tom asked me to talk a little bit about what goes on at a ranch. And a lot of you here are in the ranching community, so this may be not news to your ears. But in the early days, one of the biggest problems was screw worms. And some of you may remember them. They get into cattle when a fly lands on an open area, like a, a brand or a if you earmarked them and there's a little bit of blood or something there, castration. And they lay eggs, which pr produce the screw worm, which caused tick fever, which was really tough to deal with. And the reason ranchers never branded during fly season. It was, you were always done by May, and, and, or you waited till fall. At that time, um, cowboys carried a vial, probably about this big, in their saddlebags and collected screw worms when they would find them on cattle on the land. They would mail it in and then they used tick dip on the cattle to kill the worms. The, the, the worms that they mailed in were identified as to the location of where they came from and tested and you know made sure what they were. Then in the 1960s, airplanes were used to drop sterile flies and screw worm was eventually eradicated. In the past, ranchers, and even today, pretty much know their cows. And they know that this cow has calf every year. Even though she's 10, 12 years old, we're going to keep her because she's producing. Nowadays, we have moved from just that to use DNA testing to determine something called expected progeny difference, EPD. And it predicts the fertility of bulls and cows. They can collect semen from the best EPD bulls and inseminate 
their best e EPD cows. And these are on big operations. Um, and where we buy our bulls, that's one of the first things they look at is the EPD score. Ranchers are now raising more pounds of beef with fewer cows than we did in the 1960s due to genetics. If you have a fertile bull and a receptive cow, you're going to have a much greater expectancy of, of calves. We collected samples of each year and sent them for DNA testing when we recently branded. And we utilized that DNA information to determine which cows we will no longer keep and which cows are still producing. We also semen test bulls for fertility. And that's kind of an indelicate thing to describe, but I will do my best. So the bulls are loaded into a squeeze chute, and the vet comes. And they have a very large probe that goes into the rectum of the bull. Uh, when it's turned on, it vibrates, it pulses, it does something <laughs> that makes the bull very happy. <laughs> And generally, one of the younger kids is positioned where he needs to be to collect the semen sample when it arrives. Um, then we have the microscope on the tailgate of a truck that the vet brings. We put uh, the sample on the slide. And then you look to see, you know, is this a very generous amount of swimmers in there or not? And then you know. Do you need to not use this bull anymore and sell him? Or if everything is good? The other thing that's new now in the modern era is that, like I said, prior to the Forest Service in 1905, ranches were all open range with those Mexican longhorn cattle everywhere. Thus, overgrazing did result in a number, uh, resulted in the reduction of the number of cattle someone could run on their ranch. In 1966, my dad's head permit was cut in half because of the severe drought in the 60s. He had two of us in college and four more coming along. And he was always a forward thinker. And he always used to tell us, you have to think 10 years ahead about what you want to happen. So he got in touch with the U of A, and they came and described a rest rotation grazing pattern, where instead of just having a handful of pastures by that time, they suggested creating even more, subdividing all those pastures to have more pastures to move the cattle more frequently. We, we started doing that. And it did improve range conditions. And gradually, we were able to build the herd back up. So then how do we test how much grass is on the ground, what plants are there? And back probably in the 80s, um, as I remember, we would go out to a certain area of a pasture, and we would throw a dart over our shoulder. And where would that dart landed, the other people had a framework, maybe PVC pipe or whatever, uh, that was put together in a square. You put that over the dart, and then you clipped and identified every plant species that you saw in that square. And then that was weighed. And then from the weight, you could determine a rough estimate of that pasture, how much was there, and then how many cattle you could run there. Now we, knew we use a more scientific monitoring system in conjunction with the Forest Service, the U of A Extension Service, and the rancher in an adjunct relationship instead of adversarial. This, with three people or three sets of eyes gathering data and looking at the range. It provides oversight and accountability. So there's not just the rancher's description of his data as gospel, 
or the Forest Service when they monitor, which is how it used to be. We have transects in each pasture set up with a GPS marked with monuments and a rain gauge. You start at the monument and you take two steps in a specific direction, put down your frame, and then clip and save the plants and identify every species there. And then you repeat that again and again and again. But this GPS system creates the ability to monitor the same area the same way every time. And annual rainfall is measured as well. We have the rain gauge in every pasture. A thousand pound cow needs approximately 3% of its body weight in forage per day. So one cow needs 33 pounds per day. Cattle can only use 30% of all of the forage that's available in that pasture. So you figure out mathematically, which is never my strong suit, um, and see how long, how many days can how many cattle stay in that pasture. Um, when the cattle are moved out, uh, we go back. Uh, and sometimes this is more just drive by and look at it, and the Forest Service does it, we do it, and just eyeball it and can tell that it hasn't reached the 30%, over 30% grazing there. But if plants are not grazed, they die, because photosynthesis cannot occur, just like when your lawn doesn't get mowed. So then I wanted to kind of talk about some fun stuff and show you some of the things that I brought. Everything a cow gives us. Can any of you think of what you get from a cow? M milk, <laughs> beef, which is protein. Marshmallows. Marshmallows. What other parts of the cow? The hide. The hide is made into leather, footballs, all of those kinds of things. Not beef hooves, the, the, the going menudo, I think that's not beef. No, I don't eat Yeah, but the trite from the stomach, people eat the brains, the liver, the heart, the stomach. It's, the cow can, is used to produce insulin, visine eye drops. Did you know cows were responsible for one of the ingredients in that? And we like to say the only thing left is the moo in the cow. There's also been a lot of excitement with um, global warming discussions and methane involvement. And so the radical environmentalists want all grazing off, and I don't know where they're going to get their meat unless it's just go to Safeway and buy it, <laughs> which is what some people think they do. But when you consider the thousands of head of cattle that are in the U.S. today, it only results in 2% of the total methane produced. So some of the medications that we use, and we do, um, we have a log book, and we document the uh, name of the vaccine that we're going to use every year. It's usually the same one. But the main one is for black leg. And, and black leg still exists because it's caused by a spore in the ground. The cows eat it, and then they get sick, and they die. But what I learned recently from my brother um, is you can tell when you find a dead calf or a dead cow, um, you can feel the hide. And you know that pack, packing material that has all the little bubbles that kids like to stomp on? And he said, if you push on that hide, it will crackle, just like those little pockets when you step on them. The vaccine protects against respiratory diseases, shipping fever, scours, which is really bad diarrhea that can kill a calf. And sometimes we do use antibiotics. Just like in humans, they're used for infections, like if a cow gets mastitis, uh, a prolapsed uterus is when a cow gives birth and, and it protrudes back from the vagina outside the cow. That can have a lot of sores on it and is a source for infection. So antibiotics would be used in those um, situations. 
The other time is when there is bites from predators, bears, lions we don't see much because they usually finish the job when they start it, but coyotes can injure calves. And recently, we found a little bull calf in a far pasture that had been bitten by a bear, had two big bite marks on his shoulders, and got him back to the ranch and weren't real sure he was going to make it. But with doctoring and cleaning the wounds daily, antibiotics, all of that, he survived and is doing fine. My sister named him Duke. And one of the things you sometimes don't want to do is name your cows because then you get so attached. And that can be tough. But Duke is still doing well. When they get an antibiotic, there's a special colored ear tag that is used to identify that 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 steer or that heifer has had antibiotics or that cow. But antibiotics are out of the system in approximately 21 days. So there's nothing by the time it gets butchered that's going to hurt or have any effect on humans. The modern rancher has to be a vet, an agronomist, a scientist, a politician, a lawyer. And politician-wise, a lot of Gila County cattle growers in the past have formed um, groups that went back to DC to visit with their council, uh, their representatives, and their senators when they were faced with a particular issue that needed governmental intervention. But anyway, in addition to being all of these things nowadays, the first and foremost is a cowboy, because cattle are all gathered by horseback by cowboys. If we didn't have the modern cowboy who was related to the old-fashioned cowboy, and passed all that knowledge down, we wouldn't be where we are today. But I brought a, a few things just to kind of demonstrate. But back in the day, like I showed you in that picture, the cattle were drugged and branded um, with a, a, the, a fire. And first thing the guys had to do was find the wood, start the fire, get it hot enough to heat up these irons, which can take a fairly long time to do. And I just brought a couple. But this one we used, and we could make the X and the 4 just from this one iron. The other one that we used was when they dehorn. And this is for cautery. And they, they either use the, um, what do you call that thing, Brent? The dehorner machine. or thing, or a pocket knife, depending on how deep that, the, the horn goes. But then this is applied to stop the bleeding. And back in the day when there were screw worms, that helped d deter um, the screw worms. Um, the other thing we do is vaccinate. And this is an example of the syringe we use. And you can fill it with the vaccine, and then it's calibrated. So you only give the calf or the mama however many cc's that the directions tell you to give. I talked about castration. And back in the day, it was done with a pocket knife. And they would slice open the sack and then reach in and get the testicles down. And then there, they had a big clamp that would clamp them off. And then you had something to eat when you were done. You could put it on the grill. <laughs> Nowadays, they use this device a lot because it's less stressful on the calf, less risk for infection. And it is a, I don't want to, you put this little round castrating band. We call them donuts. Or Cheerios, yes. <laughs> but you put it on there. And I'm going to point it this way in case it goes off. It did that in my kitchen the other day. But you squeeze it open. And then you get the testicles in there, close it. The band stays up high. And pretty soon it just shrivels and withers and, yeah, and no open wounds. And, it, and they're gone. So that's one of the new modern inventions. And then this is just the, um, the notcher that we use to collect the DNA samples. You just put it on the ear, almost like getting your ear pierced. 
And I think this iron should be hot. Yes, it is. Can you hold the back side of it? Okay. It does. We um, have gone to an electric branding iron, which is quicker and easier for the person doing the branding. And um, it's going to be hard to kind of show you, but I'll do my best here. So you put it down. Oh, I'm going to slide around here. There's the X. And there you have the X4. And it's that quick. You can unplug it. Um, I talked about loss to depredation, to depredation from lions and bears, and I wanted to share one last story with you. When I was, well, I was probably five or six years old, and my dad had been on Roundup with his cowboys, and they ran across a lion kill of a calf. And more than one, there were several different calves that he had found killed. So he called the lion hunter with lion dogs. They came and they rode for several days with their guns and trying to find this lion with no luck. So the lion guy went home and my dad was out on Roundup the next day with his cowboys and darned if they didn't run across the lion. And my dad, if any of you ever knew him, knows he had a bit of a temper and was very, you know, uh, aggravated about this lion. So he told the guys to hoop and holler and to tree that lion. So they did, and they got him up in the tree. My dad climbed the tree after him, roped the lion, choked him, and got him out of the tree and brought him back to the house so we could all see him. Dead. He was dead. He was choked dead in the tree, hung him up in there. But anyway, so of course the word got around in town and his friend was a photographer in town and took his picture um, with the lion that he killed out of the tree. I don't know too many people who would climb a tree after a, a lion growling at you. But that was in 1951. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. How do you develop your brand, or how do you know your brand, and how do other ranchers know that's your brand? Good question. Um, you can create your own brand and submit it to the state. All brands are registered with the state of Arizona. All earmarks that we do. Every rancher has a specific way of notching a calf's ear, and between the ear mark and the brand, it identifies your cattle. And back in the day, you wanted to be careful that you had a brand that was not easily altered by wrestlers, where they could take an iron and add to it and make it look like something else. But um, the, the brands are registered, and pretty much in Gila County, everybody knows that their own brand, their own cattle, and if it's not theirs. And we have uh, visitors from neighboring ranches, and ours will sometimes go across the fence and visit. And we just call each other and arrange to get ours back and theirs back to them or whatever. But yes, good question. How did you come up with that? It was in existence when my grandfather got it. It was the previous brand that the previous owner had, had used and he just kept that one. He had the JU, the Flying V, the wine glass on Cherry Creek, um, the Pringle Ranch, I don't remember, the I Lazy HL was one of them. He had several with all the different ranches that he had owned at one time. Yes, sir. Around uh, market time, when it's time to sell your cattle or whatever, can you tell me the, the process? I mean, Sale and where did it go? From okay, you bet. Um, so there are a couple of different ways. Um, you can contract with a, a private cattle buyer 
who comes and looks at your cattle and gives you a price, and that's what you, know, you agree on. We used to have an auction down at Birch Sale Yard that was very successful for a long time. A lot of buyers showed up. You brought your cattle in, and then they bid against each other, just like you would on a piece of antique furniture. But however the cows, there has to be a brand inspector to make sure that these are the cows they say we say they are. Um, and then they are shipped to feedlots in Texas, usually, or somewhere, where they're fattened up before they go on to the slaughterhouse and wherever they go, you know, and then to Safeway. Um, but yeah, and it, it's generally done in the spring when yearlings, once, it, once it's January, that calf born the previous year becomes a yearling, and then they can be sold. Um, ranchers usually try to, if they're selling a group at sale, have a uniform weight and color of the bunch going to be auctioned off, because for whatever reason, cattle buyers like them uniform, and the public likes black Angus cows. So if you have a whole bunch of black ones in there, they tend to do a little bit better in some years, and that trend changes periodically as well. Any other questions? I have one more. Yes, sir. Middle part of May, or like you say, in the spring, we see them come down our past, past our house, but, you know, traders full of cattle. Right. Now, can you tell them where they're headed to market? Um, well, in we have two places that we use. There's an auction in Marana once a week, <laughs> and another one in Wilcox once a week. So depending on, you know, and you watch the cattle market and you see what cattle are going for, but then we will haul our own cattle down to Marana or hire a truck to take them if there's a lot of them, or Wilcox, whichever. Yes? There's a little town in Colorado called Carbondale. It's outside of Aspen, okay. and every year, the ranchers take all of their steers and they run it through the middle of town. Oh my and it's a big deal. I think you guys should do that here. Oh my uh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a sight to see, I'll tell you. <laughs> Just like the old days. It's like in Fort Worth when all the longhorns come. Right. Yeah. People ask, well, why do you have to dehorn? Well, it's to protect the cattle, so if they get in a, you know, a fight on the range, they're not goring each other with, with uh, their horns. And also, if you've ever been chased by a bad mama cow, you don't want her to have horns, and I've been in that situation, too. Yes? Did, did the Griffins ever retain ownership on their yearlings and send them to the feed yard ever? Or? We never have. We've always sold one way or another every spring. Can you tell me how many ranches there are here in the Globe Miami area? There are a hundred or so allotments on the Tano National Forest. And that doesn't mean there's a hundred ranchers because one rancher can have two or three separate allotments or adjoining allotments. Um, the total number of ranchers, do you have any idea, Velma? Not I don't either, not, figure it out. yeah, but there are, uh, you know, the economic impact from cattle in Gila County is huge, and I wish I could remember all of the numbers my brother told me, but with the, um, the groceries you spend to feed your crew, the uh, fuel you buy to transport these animals, the the Walmart trips, the now Cal Ranch trips, or wherever you need to buy things, it's putting money back into Gila County. Um, and there's, uh, it's a significant impact. Approximately how much do you profit off of one head? Uh, prob it varies on how much the one weighs in, you know, 800 to $1,200. If a cow is bred, she gets more than a cow that's not with child. Um, 
So it, and it just depends. If it's at an auction, then that varies according to the, the bidding. But yes, profit? No, no, no. That's what we get from. But then you count all of the man hours put into doing them, all of the things that go on. Then you must love it to do it because it's not very profitable. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> very true. Our dad, when we were raised with having five girls, and the one brother told all of the daughters, this ranch is not going to support six kids. All of you go off to college and become something. Yeah. So all of us went to college and went into the pretty much medical field because my dad said that's what we had to do. <laughs> well, and when he was, was growing up, when you think back about some of the history, he grew up with many, many women raising their families. The husbands died young, um, and these women were faced with supporting their family. And he saw how difficult it was for his own mother, um, for his grandmother, everybody, and that was part of it, is that he wanted us to be prepared should we ever be faced with a situation like that. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for coming. I enjoyed being here.